I have a lot here, so some of this I'm going to go over faster than other parts. If we don't finish it, we'll continue it next time. Um, but what I'm about ready to uh, equip you with, share with you, is to me one of the missing ingredients in the church at large. And it, it's such an essential thing. We've talked here a number of times about making disciples, yeah? Yeah. Well, get this. How many of you know the Great Commission? Have you memorized that scripture? That's, that's a kind of a common one. I don't know if you ever saw it in that same paragraph. It's sort of interesting. He took the 11. And the reason why there's not 12 is Judas isn't there anymore. So he takes 11 to a hill. Now, if you think about Jesus sharing with the 11 who are about to become apostles, right? The foundations of the church of Jesus Christ. Don't you think that those words would be pretty important? Because he's going to take off, literally. You know, he's, he's going to ascend. And, uh, you know, so he takes them to a hill. And so I, I think this little paragraph, his last words to the soon-to-be apostles have to be paramount. And it says that he took them there to the hill, and they believed, but some doubted. This is in the eleven. Like, some doubted, really? <laughs> Jesus is standing right there. You know, and, and he, he's not on the cross, he's not on the tomb. Amazing the human capacity <laughs> for lack of faith as well as faith. Yeah. You know, it, it's amazing the human capacity we have. So he says, amazing statement, he goes, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. This isn't a little Bible study. He is talking about himself. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. How much authority is that? All. You look it up in the Greek, it means all. In heaven and earth. I mean, immense. Why is he saying that? Is he bragging? Yeah, because of what he's going to say. Then he says, therefore, because of that statement, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now he's going to, he's saying it for research. He says, therefore, you go. Mm -hmm. So he wants them to know on whose authority they're going on. Mm -hmm. Heaven and earth. There's going to be a war that's going to take place. And he goes, therefore, you go and you make disciples. This was so intense for him. We don't want just people to be in pew warmers. We don't want... He goes, there, go and make disciples. And then he says, teaching them to do all I commanded you. Now, what did Jesus command the disciples to do? What did they do when they're on earth with Jesus? Preach the gospel of the kingdom. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. That's a good one. Cast out demons. You know, feed the poor by the broken. So he basically commanded them to do the very things he modeled that he did. So it wasn't new. It was, he was already doing it. So keep in mind, this is uh, put yourself in this time. Not just a historical thing. Let's say you're one of these disciples. So you've been with Jesus. You saw it. He's, he's, he's your hero. He's your God. He's, he's risen from the... It's like, yes, Jesus, this is awesome. You know, the mighty one. The Son of God, whatever terms you want to use. And, uh, but he now wants you to continue the exact same things he was doing. So on the one hand, it's like, well, but you're Jesus. You're the one with all authority in heaven and earth. So he goes on and he says, all right. Therefore, you go into all the world and you make disciples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We just did a baptism at the lake Sunday. It was so cool. People out there drinking beer and partying at the point out there. And, and uh, we're ducky people. And, um, one time I did a baptism in Avila Beach. And uh, it was about 100 people on the shore. We were worshiping. We were baptizing people. And then all of a sudden, a whole squad of cops show up in the parking lot. And... Uh, Myself and the guys baptized, the only ones that can see that because everybody else's back is yeah. to the parking lot. So I'm saying, what's going on? Then they start in full gear coming toward us. Whoa. Very intent. And it's like, 
Somebody called them and said we were gang members drowning people in the ocean. <laughs> so the, the riot squad showed up. So I stop, so I go over and explain what's going on. Oh uh, man, I'm sorry, I scared the heck out of you guys. I, like, I didn't shoot anybody, I, like, I didn't tackle anybody. I, man, anyway, that, that's just a free one. Okay. <laughs> Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to do all I commanded you. And then how do you do it again? Lo, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. That's the answer. He has all authority on earth, and he will be with you to make disciples just like he was and he made them. So that's a backdrop to what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about releasing and empowering for ministry. So some basic assumptions that we're going to go over pretty quickly in building God's people. It's God purposes that will prevail. That sounds so obvious. But I have been in tons of board meetings, tons of different kind of church meetings, where it's our ideas going on. Have you ever been in one of those? Yeah. And they're not even bad ideas. And so sometimes in my own group, I'll, I'll catch myself or ourselves, and it's like, well, maybe we should do that. Uh, this is a good idea. Uh, another church is doing this. You know, it, it could be, and, and it's like, well, has God told us to do this? I, I think this is his house. Amen. You know, this is his church. Like, what does he want us to do? So it's not just good ideas. It's not just generating programs. Programs is last. But many people start with programs. Well, we're a group, we're a church, we got to have programs. But if you don't know why you're having that program, it's going to be worthless. And uh, you're going to see that more in a minute. So it's God's purposes that prevails. Um, it's one of the ways he works is through authentic community, the church. Um, you will not fare well if you are independent from the body of Christ. Amen. It doesn't work that way. It's not just you and God. It won't work that way. One of the way, main ways God ministers to people is through other saints. Just like you saw earlier today. You, you can't just be independent. You cannot have authority unless you're under authority. Did you know that? So being independent rebellious won't get good applause from heaven. Right. Even if you're extremely gifted, it'll be limited at best. Right. So that's one of the main ways it works together. Uh, all of God's people are called to serve. Everybody gets to play. That's how I look at it. We all get to play. Not a few superstars. We're not in the football stands and cheering for our heroes on the stage of a church. We, are, we all get to play in the game. We all have a part. God created Israel and the tribes for a purpose. Remember that? Why did God create Israel? To show His glory. Yeah. To be a light to the nations, He says. He's going to multiply them like the sands of the sea and the stars of the sky. And He gives them His word. He gives them the priesthood. He gives them the tabernacle. He gives them amazing leaders. And He gives them favor and miracles. And He, he gives them so much to accomplish being a light to the nations. Blessing to the nations. Jesus recruited the twelve to build his church. Upon this rock, he said, I will build my church. We are to be an army, not an audience. That is the new mentality. Amen. We need to get out of the pulpit into the pews. We don't have pews here. Chairs. Couches. Couches of chairs. <laughs> Now here's one, and, uh, and more for the leadership here. Volunteerism does not work. Boy, it's quiet. <laughs> you know the announcement, well, we need so-and-so to do something. It's okay, but it's really not going to accomplish much. I mean, sometimes it fills a gap, it's a need. But if you put the wrong person in the wrong place, yeah. it's going to cause bigger problems. Yeah. Yeah. You've, you've seen that one, right? I'd rather not have that ministry going on and put the wrong person and blow it up. So just people volunteering, is, is that what Jesus, did Jesus just wait around? Hey, you know, I have an announcement today at the Bread of Life show here. Uh, you know, I need some uh, guys to usher. You know, it's like, was he doing that? He had something way more strong than that in mind. Did he go to people? Yes. yes. And he called them to commitment. Some didn't do it. 
right? They didn't all say yes to him. There was rejection. Some thought they wanted to. Well, what must I do? Well, you need to sell everything. Well, what? That's a hard saying. And he left. You know, just think of that guy's destiny, how different it could have been. We would have known his name. He would have been one of them. It's a really interesting little side story. You know, he even answered right. Well, you know, love Lord, all this stuff. He goes, what must I do personally? Well, you need to sell everything and minister to the poor. Like, what? And follow me? What? You know, well, I got a state. I got a... So we either try to work on our earthly inheritance or our spiritual in heaven, our heavenly inheritance. Treasure in heaven. So those are some basic assumptions. The foundation stones, it all starts with a vision. And building people into the fabric, I like that word, of his purposes. So since it's his purposes that prevail, we need to we discern what that is. And then we need to come together and get vision. Where do you get vision from? It's not from brainstorming. It's from seeking God. A vision comes from heaven. That's why it's a vision. It's not a goal and plans at this point. That's Amen. different. The humans get more involved in that part. But, but the vision can only be God breathed. And each, to me, the church at large is like tribes. It's like, is it, we're, we're different tribes. We're not supposed to all be the same. We're to be one, we're to be united. But we have different flavors. You know, there's loud churches, quiet churches. You know, there, there's people that sit when they teach. There's people that rant and rave when they teach. You know, you know, there's people that, you know, there's a, there's rock and roll music in churches, there's pipe organs, you know, it's just, one's not better than the other, they're just different flavors in the body of Christ. So, everything a church does is a bridge to one group of people and a barrier to another group of people. You cannot make everybody happy in one ministry, in one church. So don't try. I learned that a long time ago, I'm not here to make everybody happy. All I want to know is what does the Lord want? And then he'll bring people that are part of that vision to this particular ministry. Amen. But bless the other ones. I know I am not all there is. Our church is not all there is. This is just our part. Amen. And uh, so, the, so I, I really, I don't like when people put down other churches. Because they may be doing exactly what God wants to do, but it might be very different than what your part is. Right. So I don't sweat that because I'm not God. I don't know what he's told them. I used to do that. I used to get mad. I remember what one pastor got to do what God told me I couldn't do. I said, that's not right. I'm going to confront that guy. And the Lord said, oh, really? How do you know what I told him? You just, you just do what I told you to do. What? You know, I thought it was all, you know, one size fits all or something, but it didn't work out that way. That's free too. Um, Paul, at one point when he's in front of Agrippa, he says, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. Paul was so full of vision, you could not stop, you could beat him, you yeah. could whip him, he could be in the sea three times, he, he could be beat up and get on a balcony and preach some more, you know. <laughs> he would go and persecute, he'd preach in prison, he'd preach outside of prison, he just went for it. because And he had that sense of purpose, that divine destiny, that vision from heaven. I mean, he literally had... We know in the scriptures in Acts what happened to him. He yeah. got knocked down. And, <laughs> I'm Jesus whom you crucified. <gasps> wow. So, very important. It gives you a strength when, when you have vision as a people. And then, uh, one of the favorite things I like as a leader is getting the vision first and getting to spin the vision to people. And then the hard part is getting people to join in. Because not everybody's at church or any ministry for that vision. But sometimes they're supposed to be part of it, but they don't even know it. Yeah. So sometimes there's resistant or, well, I'm uncomfortable. I don't want to do something uncomfortable. <laughs> you don't, have you ever read this book? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's funny sometimes when they say he's a gentleman. I Really? <laughs> I don't know. Like, that's what you mean by that. You know, that's uh, So, uh, you know, he, he's in the business of shaking us up and creating, and there's fear that you have to walk through to have faith. You have to pass through the fear barrier to faith. 
Because your flesh has to be crucified. There's no other way. You don't have the ability on your own flesh to accomplish God's will. No matter how charismatic you are, large personality, he will use those things, but it won't have any import that only the Spirit can do. We get to be there when he does it. It's, it's a real blessing. He, it's a privilege that he lets us be part of what he's doing. You know, so you've probably heard it's like trying to herd a herd of cats. You know, it's, it's really hard to get everybody in order. It's, uh, but when it does, when it does click, when you, when you get a centrifugal force, enough people in line, it starts teaching itself. You know, and some things are even simple, but they, they're big at the same time. And so when and enough people gather to a vision and start participating, it teaches it, because now it's seen and heard. It's not just taught, but it's seen and heard. You with me so far? Yeah. I'm teaching you stuff that I do with pastor's meetings. So I hope I'm not boring you, because I know a lot of you know aren't no, it's that, but... Um, be intention about making disciples intentioned about it. Prayerful thinking is or should be a major part of your ministry and work. Look for people. If you're any kind of leader or even if whatever your part is maybe in a smaller level because we're all to make disciples. It's not just leaders that make They might do it in a more massive way but when you have multiplication not addition. If I'm making disciples that's addition. But if I'm doing it and Kim is doing it Linda's doing it, you're doing it, now we have multiplication. So maybe, and gifts are different. You, you don't know if, if you have 100 talents or 10 talents. It, the pay is the same in the end. Amen. It doesn't matter. You're just supposed to invest what he's giving you. So, so if one person is ministering, you know, developing 10 leaders and disciples, another one's doing two, that's great. They're doing what they're supposed to do. That's their part. So, um, Huge. So you, you look, just add that to you. Who has God given you faith for? Sometimes I just get faith for somebody. Or I see a calling on their life. Sometimes I'll see something and I won't tell them for two years or so. Because it will abort it. But, I, but I'm already going to give them little invites. Little, come be with me. Come, will you do that? And I'll, I'm going to see how they're going to test out. Wow. Then more will be given. If you're faithful in little, little things, you will be ruler of much. So there's an intention in my mind. And I've had great friends. I, I, I invited them to join in sometimes for years. No, no. And the, you know, they, they feel like I'm not worthy enough or whatever reasons are. And then one day it clicks and they'll step in. Sometimes years later. So I don't get mad. I just let the spirit work. I invite All right, well. If you're not ready, you put the doors open and you keep salting it. Look to the horizon where heaven and earth meet. I like that word picture. You know, when you look out at the ocean and you see the sky and the ocean, or let's say Maui. <laughs> Island, that's even better. <laughs> I think heaven and earth did beat there. <laughs> I love that place. Anyway, um, I've, I've asked God for that when I go to heaven. Like, can I have Maui? Like, <laughs> so, <laughs> that's not going to be sound, but anyway. Uh, uh, you know, meaning, what is God blessing? Where, where does heaven come into our world? You know, and my, our part, my part. Where, where's it? Not just my world and trying to convince God to bless my ideas or my thoughts. You, you find out what God is doing in blessing, and you join that. A lot less strife that way. So we get vision. So like we said, there's only one place to get that. You can't just read a book and get it. You can't just brainstorm and get it. I mean, you might, in those times, God might show up and give vision. And then you plan. You don't plan first. If you don't know what your purposes are, what are you planning for? You know? And then, then you go to programs. You know, that, then how are we going to facilitate what God's purposes are? And then you get people to do it, personnel. 
So sometimes people go the other way around. They start with a program and then try to get people to do the program, but you ask them, why are you doing it? I don't know. All churches do this. So um, I, I just met with our youth leaders. Our, our, um, we just sent them on a little retreat to Morro Bay. And so the main leader, I asked him, I said, well, where do you intend to take these kids? What do you mean? What do you, where do you intend to take this youth group? You know, are you going to just meet together and just have a lot of fun and do a little Bible study? There's, there's a lot of good things about that, but is there any sense of vision? And he, he just was like, goes, can you write some stuff down for me? I will, but you're going to have to sort it out. You know, I'll help you. So I had made some notes for him to go over with the other leaders that he was meeting with. And they're all excited. I haven't heard, I haven't talked to them yet, but they were all are excited about recruiting. So I said, you need to recruit other people. Are you going to just keep this your own little group? You know, be inclusive. There's other gifts out there that could add to this thing. You know. So they have some people in mind. So it's kind of cool. But just to stir them up, stir them up. Jesus is coming back for a fat bride. <laughs> Big bride, right? Yeah. Lots of people, not literally obese, but uh, lots of people in the body of Christ. <laughs> What time off? It was pretty funny. Um, do, how many of you know who John Wimper is? Yeah. Most of you. Um, he was the main mentor in my life. I, I miss him so much. He did so much in my life. It allowed me to do so many things and opened huge doors for me I wouldn't have done myself. I mean, I've been all over the world because of that guy. I mean, it's Jesus through him, but it's been amazing. So anyway, uh, <laughs> I had him come to my church and uh, do a conference. So I am so excited. John Wimper's coming. This is going to be great. You know, Lonnie Frisbee's going to be It's like, this is awesome. We're going to blow up this place. And it was great. <laughs> then we go to my office afterwards. And he goes, Jack, do you know you have more of a gang here than a team? <laughs> well, because of my background, I kind of like the idea of a gang. So I saw, I thought, well, <laughs> what do you mean? Like, he goes, well, uh, you, you, there's some things you don't know about yourself. So now I'm going to look, I'm young, I'm really young, I'm in my 20s. So I am cocky. And my church was big. I thought we were doing good. And I go, like what? <laughs> and he goes, what you don't know is you're one of the most intuitive leaders I've ever met. I didn't even know what intuitive meant at that point. <laughs> it was like, and he goes, and you think other people think like you do, but most of them don't. I go, what do you mean? See, you don't know this about yourself. <laughs> well, what do you mean? He goes, well, you know things in here, and you're a knower. You, you discern things, but you can't say it. Yes, I can. He goes, all right. What do you look for first in a leader? So, well, I don't know. I don't think that way. He goes, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> this is the great, greatest father-son talk. Like, and uh, he goes, you, you have amazing leaders on your staff because you know they're leaders, but you can't tell me why they're leaders. So that means you can't make disciples because you can't tell other leaders what to look for in leaders. That hit me. I thought, oh. So you, you know, but you can't tell them what you know because you can't define what's inside. Mm. So I said, well, what do I do? He goes, well, that's your strength. You have this discernment, but you, you're not a detailed person. I, amen. Amen. Yes, I am not. But that was not new to me. And uh, he goes, you need to go to conferences, read books, listen to tapes, rip off stuff. He goes, remember, you know how when you hear somebody teaching, they'll say something in a way, and you, you already know it, but they say it better than you could? Yeah. He goes, write it down. They have something more defined. You know it inside, but you can't say it. So start making outlines. I never had outlines before. Just off the cuff. Off the cuff. That was my style. Um, he goes, write down outlines so you can transfer things to other people. You can make disciples. You can make leaders of leaders of leaders. 
goes, I'm telling you this, I don't care if it stings you a little bit, because I want you to go as far as possible in the kingdom. So, in releasing ministry, dis dismissing versus delegating and transferring mentality. Some pastors, some leaders, know that they need to get other people involved, but they just delegate it. They don't train them. They don't equip them. They just delegate it, and then they wonder why it falls apart. Amen. Have you seen that? Yeah. So they have the right idea. They're trying to get other people involved, but there's so much, in order to be united and accomplish something together, so much more involved than just do this job, fill this gap, fill Amen. this need. Amen. So we need to have something more intention in developing and nurturing and releasing in the right times of season. Depending on what it is, the higher the call, the bigger magnitude, the slower it takes. You know, to how usher doesn't take as much. Right. Amen. You know, kind of thing. So it depends, and we'll see that in a minute. Well, yeah. So key factors. The leader versus a minister mentality. A minister cares for people. It is the heart. We're all to be servants. We're all to be ministers. If you're an apostle, we're to be servants, ministers. But if you're a leader, you think differently. You do things through other people, not everything yourself. A minister cares for people themselves. Both are good, but they are different. A leader has influence on people and equips people and multiplies things through other folks. So they, they accomplish the same things, but through other people. They get a greater satisfaction out of having an army, an array of people serving and ministering than just themselves doing that. Take responsibility to lead. You know, if you are going to do something, whether it's in your own family, whether it's in the church, whether it's here, other kinds of ministries, take responsibility. And leading doesn't mean just follow me and clap your hands when I'm talking. It means leading them into the war. Mobilizing the saints for war. You went to the fray. Training versus trying. Nothing's more frustrating. Says somebody says, "Go do a job." You don't know how to do it, and it's you. It's you fail. But when somebody comes alongside and trains you, equips you, comes alongside, models for you, it accomplishes a lot. Uh, always be a learner yourself. You know. Learn to think and be challenged. Learn to respond to life and ministry, not just react. Not just responding to needs, but having a vision you're moving everybody toward. Release the ministry. We're going to have here identify, recruit, train, employ, monitor, and nurture. It's business talk or it's army talk. Uh, but it's basically a model and, and making disciples, and it's very biblical. We just are breaking it down this way. So identify the right people for the right ministry. 1 Corinthians 12... 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now you are the body of Christ. Each one of you is a part of it. If you're not participating, then you're dead cells. Each one of you is part of it, as a, as a fact. And in the church, God has appointed, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, and those uh, having gifts of healing, those who are able to help others, those with gifts of administration, those speaking in different kinds of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, are all gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret. So he's saying each one is part of this, and it's manifested in many different ways. First Peter 4, each one should use whatever gift God has received to serve or he has received, to serve others. Receive gifts, like I said earlier, to serve, to give to others. Faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. There's a bunch of forms. If, every, if anyone speaks, he should do it as one's uh, speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides. So in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Is there here's some questions. Is, is this person's character qualified, not just giftedness? Some of the most dangerous people of the body of Christ are gifted people. 
one of the difficulties is the human factor in the church. Because if somebody is gifted, sometimes they wear it like a badge of hyper-spirituality. And it actually harms the body of Christ. It doesn't bring it together. You know, servant is the basic line. You know, uh, I don't care about titles. You know, somebody might come to me and say, I visit my church, you go, I'm elder so-and-so. I go, yeah, well, you're elding. <laughs> well, I retired now. Then you're not an elder. You're only an elder if you're elding. <laughs> you know, I'm apostle so-and-so. Who told you that? <laughs> you know, how do you define that? Yeah. You know, and it's amazing some of the answers I get. And why are you telling me this? It's like, yeah. am I supposed to be impressed? That it's about you and not God. So titles, I don't like to. They to me, they just describe a function that you do. Right. You know. Are they committed to your vision? Are they a team player? Huge issue. One one of the things that is difficult for me. Sometimes I'll see giftedness. Some of them be a great asset to the team, but they're just independent. And I want them to join up so much because. They need us, we need them, and sometimes they do, sometimes they don't over time. But sometimes I'll watch, and they'll even get frustrated, and they don't realize that independent, rebellious spirit unattaches them from it. Another John Wimber talk. He was the best rebuker I've ever met. He would rebuke me, and I didn't even know it till later. I'd go home, wait a minute, I think I was just rebuked. Like, corrected. And, uh, one time he goes, Jack, well, uh, what position did you play in football? I said, well, I played wide receiver. Were you a quarterback? No, I was a wide receiver. Were you a lineman? No, look at this body, I'm not as big, I'm a wide receiver. Did you play defense? No, I was a wide receiver. Like, and... Uh, well, he goes, let's say you were the best wide receiver in the world. If you had a lousy quarterback, would you make a lot of touchdowns? No. Well, if you had a good quarterback and you were the best wide receiver, but the offensive line couldn't stop the, the defense from tackling the quarterback, would you make a lot of catches? No. What if you had an awesome offense, but your defense couldn't do anything and stop the other team? Would you win the games? No. So, again, it's one of those, I'm thinking, what is he talking about? But he did fit, pick my favorite sport, and, uh, and I don't even remember him talking to him about football. And so, uh, he goes, well, I think you've been hurt. I brows down again, what do you mean? I don't know, it might be a father thing or something. I think, and, and you have such a fierce thing of not wanting to be controlled by people. And uh, that you become independent, stubborn, and rebellious. Ouch. Carol Wimber, Carol Wimber, his wife. She goes, John, you were just like that in his age. He goes, shut up, I'm trying to help the young man. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Carol. Like, <laughs> and, uh, and he goes, I, I, I you, um, you, you just, you don't want to lose your identity. He goes, but I, I want to tell you right now, I'm hoping you're going to play in our team. I don't want to change your identity. We, we need a wide receiver in our team. But you need a quarterback. And you need the linemen and the defense, and we need to practice together, do the X's and O's, and have a plan. He goes, I'm hoping you're going to join up. I want you on our team, and I don't want to change you. I want who you are, but Amen. you need us to, to win Amen. the game. Good work. It was like, Wow. Wow, that is for a whole bunch of you in the room right now. Mm -hmm. Good Amen. So I joined up. <laughs> yeah. It's a good thing. Yes. So we look for character, we look for team players. What level of giftedness is needed for this ministry? So if it's an unskilled worker, you, you don't have to do a lot of equipping and training other than if you don't know how to make coffee, we'll teach you how to make coffee, you know, or where's the stuff to bring the, we call it the Garden of Eden at our church. 
Eat them. Eat them. So, so, but there's a lot of work to setting all that up. So there's a crew that they're part of our family, and they do that every week. They set up the Garden of Eaton and the, the, the things. So, skilled worker. You know, uh, somebody that coordinates, oversees other people. Uh, an overseer, that a leader of leaders. You know, executive leader, staff. You know, I hire people when I see them go through this process. I don't hire them for giftedness. Big mistake. Because you can be equipped and trained to do lots of things if the heart is right, if we're together for one, if we have a vision that's together, good values. It's huge. Um, and then recruit people into the ministry. So we start with relationship, we identify people, we're looking for the different skill levels, the character, uh, identifying that, and then we recruit people in the ministry. Uh, invest in relationship. We need to be task oriented and relational oriented, not either or. <clears throat> if you do one or the other, it will dismantle it. Uh, huge. Uh, just yesterday, I met with some guys, and uh, and I felt it was time. There's a guy I've been talking to him for over a year about starting uh, an addiction kind of ministry, and uh, and then. There were some other people that were really wrestling that. So I brought some together. And I just sat down and I said, it's time now to start this. You've been praying to think about it long enough. So I just kind of got at their face. I think it's time to do something about this. And I will help you. I can get the resource you need. I will help you. I'll show you how to develop things. Are you in or out? I mean, it was like one of those talks. So they're going to do it. Yeah. At least right now. And I'll, maybe after I left, maybe they go, what did we just do? We're like... That was scary, you know, whatever might have happened, but I was very intent and very intentioned about it because we have some really hurting people in that arena. And I also, because I'm half evangelist, thought this would be a great outreach in the community as well. Who we don't even know. Because it's a big deal these days, yeah. addictions. Yeah, so, um, so people uh, communicate, play, and pray together, work together more effectively. Go do fun stuff. Mitzi always gets happy. I say, let's go to lunch or breakfast. You know, we have Perry. I just hired another pastor, associate pastor. And he's at it a lot. And, you know, it's just more. So we, we, we tease around a lot. We do practical jokes. She did a fart candle. <laughs> she gave me a candle that said apple pie. <laughs> Little cute Mitzi. <laughs> and you, it burns down a little ways, and then it smells like a fart in your office. <laughs> <laughs> that's stole her car. She called her husband and everything was really funny. I just want you to know she needs some discipline. <laughs> Who do you have faith for? Who has God given you? You know, sometimes I'll even meet somebody that's not even in my church, I'll, I'll, you know, a cop or something, and I just know they're going to join us. There's no reason to know that. And I don't say anything because I'm not sure until after the fact. But it's happened to me many times where I'll meet somebody and I think, we're going to work together. We're going we're gonna to be shoulder by shoulder. We're, there's going to be something happening. And I just kind of wait. I don't say anything unless I'm supposed to. I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, Jesus said, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Give them a personal challenge like the ones I was talking about. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. When, when you have faith in somebody, you know what their calling is. You, you call them into that calling. You, you, bring, you invite them in relationally and equipping and friendship and you know, all the above. Uh, create an encouraging atmosphere to grow and to risk. Love, acceptance, and forgiveness. You know, not judgment. Uh, distinguish between genuine people and opportunists. Time is on your side. Watch what people do, not just what they say. I learned a long time ago, I'm more impressed with what people do than what people say. Amen. Like people that talk a lot, sometimes they're not doers. It's a weird formula. It's easier to identify and recruit leadership than to unidentify and remove leadership. <laughs> Amen to that. 
Oh, oh man. Uh, be clear that you are recruiting them into a job description, requirements, time commitment, cost. Let them know what they're committing to, because if you don't, they'll have one expectation, expectation, you'll have another, and if it's not the same, you're going to have frustration, difficulty. So if you do, and you could change it, but it's some place to start. Uh, the Jesus, the Jesus show and tell model. This is huge to us. This is this is what is right out of the Bible. Jesus did the show and tell model. He doesn't say that in the Bible, but what he did is this. So he take you take people with you when ministering. You know, so in the beginning, disciples just were with them. They just saw what he did, you know, and they set up things and did a little crowd control. And, but he did everything. Let them observe and then give them feedback as to what they saw. You know, what did you see? What did you experience? What did you feel? You know, well, when you pray, what happened? You know, why did that person start shaking? Or, you know, how did you know that? You know, those kinds of things. Next time, let them join in. So you invite them. You're praying side by side. And do you have anything to pray? Because oh, oh, you're, you're done praying. You want me to pray too? If you have something. You know. Next time, let them join in. As they get more proficient, let them do it on their own with someone with them, discipling, making disciples. You know, show and tell model. You know, things are more caught than taught. Yeah, yeah. Osmosis is huge. More than just classroom kind of thing. So, identify, recruit, train. Equipping. The focus on training or equipping the workers and leaders is to help them become informed, articulate, and skilled in their ministry. Training comes in three different vehicles. Formal training, like this kind of thing. Uh, training centers with classroom <coughs> instructions, seminars, formal and service training through leaders. Informal experiential training, encouraging people to minister and giving feedback as they minister. So uh, it was really pleasing to me. Last time I was here, remember, I said, I'm not going to pray for anybody. The Lord's going to heal. And then all of you started praying. And it was so precious because several people came up and said, I didn't have that happen before. You know, and as they were praying for one another. And they, they were applying the things they're teaching on how to pray for the sick. Uh, modeling and mentoring. More caught than taught through example and interaction and risk taking. You know, again, I, I know I'm sharing a lot of Wimber stories, but it's because he did this with me. So it's this personal for me. But... So it's not a comment on different kinds of models because there are different ways the church has done with people. But I remember when I first met the Lord, um, you know, I believed in the gifts of the Spirit, but I didn't see a model I could relate to. So I, the, like healing the sick, for example, I only was aware of things on television. And that particular model on TBN, I couldn't relate to. So I, I just thought, you know, I guess you have to be weird to heal the sick. <laughs> I, guess, I used to pray, Lord, bring some weird person to heal the sick. I'll, you know, but I'll be the cool guy teaching and giving people Christ. And he never asked that prayer. And, uh, you know, and then when I met John, he was naturally supernatural. And it was a model I could relate to. So I really w was more caught and taught at first. You know, I, I didn't know him personally. I was just in the audience and receive some ministry, but I was watching, and I, I started thinking to myself, I could do that. Mm -hmm. I relate to that. I didn't know you could do that. You know, I, Just by watching, I was already being discipled. Mm -hmm. And then we actually got together and became more intense. Uh, deploy. Crew train deploy. Release them into the service or their call. And you might start here and it might end up here. Uh, to station systematically over an area to spread out and form an extended front. That's all up in the military talk. People should be placed in an area that they can exercise their gifts and skills, most fruit and return of longevity. You know, if you find out what people are made for and, and facilitate that, I, I often will... Some of you will say, I want to serve. I might have just a service thing, but I, I always ask them, what do you want to do? What's in your heart? What's your passion? And I'll try to facilitate that. Sometimes it takes a while because they're going to need to be equipped. Sometimes it's an easier fit. I did that with Danny Daniels. You know, he, he shares that story all the time about how shocked he was when he said, I want to serve. I'm going to join the church. And what do you want me to do? 
I said, you're asking the wrong question. What do you want to do? And he was like, what? And he knew right away. He just had a vision. He goes, I want to get a musician's fellowship. I don't want to do evangelism. I want to worship and get worship leaders in all the small groups. And I mean, he already knew. And I said, let's do it. And then he was so faithful, I ended up hiring him. He ended up becoming a pastor on his staff. And he was very fruitful and multiplied many worship leaders over the years. Remember to transfer over time and supervision the show and tell model. And then we monitor. We, we don't just like, okay, now you're serving and I'll never talk to you again. I hope you do good out there. You know, and then now they're all lonely, like, oh, do they like me? Jack was me a lot of time before. What happened? Stay connected, give feedback and continued resources, give value and reward. I, I like sharing stories about people in my church. You know, make them heroes in the church you know, when they're, they're doing stuff. They need to be told and shown that they are an important part of the whole. Yeah. You know, like, I really, I had a, this is cool. I'm going to embarrass Mitzi. Ah, uh, yeah. I <laughs> it's dangerous to work on my staff. It, it's awesome. <laughs> Where is it? Um, the young man was visiting our church Sunday, and uh, his uh, text is not very good as far as grammar, but thank you for inviting us to your service. We had a great time. If with your permission, you will pass on a message to your music director, which we don't use that term, but Mitzi, the beautiful lady that was leaving us. I think he means leading us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And worship, please tell her that she is an anointed with that and she knows it, but just tell her that. So she keeps cultivating that in, in the depth of what she's going to be doing and going. Aww. Astonishing. She's going to be astonishing. But I just feel a real strong urge to repeat these words to you so you can repeat them to her. <laughs> <laughs> if you think it's okay. Aww. You know? And, <clears throat> So I, in our staff meeting, I was all excited. I go, I have a compliment for you. And, uh, you know, and it probably made her day. She's crying right now. Yeah. <laughs> Mission accomplished. <laughs> Stay connected. Give feedback. Oh, we're in nurture now. Continue to help them grow in life and ministry. No neglected children. The pay is the same. Whether it's a little ministry, a big ministry, it doesn't matter. Just use the gifts that God's given you. Prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up, lacking nothing. Amen. Yeah.